1982 in South Africa. There are bombings every month and civil unrest against the segregationist policies of the government. Apartheid, this racial discrimination, governed the land and oppressed the black citizens of South Africa. This included the establishment of separate homelands and encampments, the creation of passbooks for black workers, and brutal assaults and unpunished crimes against a people just based on their skin color. There were arrests and executions of those that spoke out against this form of government, one of whom was Nelson Mandela. Eventually, apartheid would end for South Africa with the help of the African National Congress and the eventual election of Nelson Mandela as its first fully democratic elected official. Post-apartheid South Africa found itself in flux and, and embittered voices cried out to be heard. A people who had been degraded and treated like animals for so long now had to find belonging in a new South Africa. Artists helped give voice to the challenges of the time and were finally allowed to express their pain openly and freely about the damage that the previous government had inflicted on its people. That pain and damage manifested itself in many different ways for young artists at the time. The shocking nature of apartheid left many scars and wounds on many people, and Nandifa Matambo was no exception. Nandifa Matambo was born in Swaziland in 1982. This was a country closely connected to South Africa and shared many of its social and political challenges. Now, Matambo was 12 years old when Mandela was elected. I mention all this because these were very formative years for this young lady, and the impact it left upon her can be seen in her artwork, as she too struggled with the pain of dealing with the residue of apartheid and a long oppressed society. Hers is a unique story and one that really plays with the role of identity and the struggle or duality that comes with being both one thing and another. When you look across the spectrum of time at her works, you'll notice that there is a conflict. There is a conflict between human and animal, male and female, power and submission. This tension raises our sensitivity to who we are individually and evokes a reaction that forces us to re-examine these rivalries in much broader scopes. Her themes help us navigate through a very thick emotional memory for her and gives an understanding of the internal trials that take place within the court of self. Before we dive into her works, let's take a moment to learn about where and when did these questions and themes manifest in Nandifa Matumbo, the artist. Matumbo originally wanted to go to school to be a pathologist. Like many of us, she loved those crime shows and detective series on TV. She says that during this time she did an internship at a forensic department in South Africa. She was shocked at the desensitization of the team, and it bothered her that they seemed so mechanical and unfeeling in their work. This scarred her somewhat and took her away from science and towards art. She was admitted into the Michaelis School of Fine Art, where she would eventually earn her master's degree under the counsel of Jane Alexander. This seems impactful at the time for reasons which will become evident later. Matumbo was still fascinated with the concepts of life and death and originally struggled to find a voice in which to help deliver her message. She says that she had a dream one night about cows and the role they played in every culture. Every culture seemed to have some connection to cows. So she went with her father to tanneries to collect cow hides for her art. She would consult with taxidermists to learn how to manipulate, manipulate this material. She says of the material, The work I create is part of an engagement with the physical and tactile properties of cowhide and aspects of control that allow or prevent me from manipulating this organic material. In my process of wrapping, hooking, grinding, washing, and cleaning, I am conscious of the subject of memory and how this informs both my process and end product. While working, I think of the material memory that remains in the cells of each hide and of the universal cultural and historical memory associated with the cow as deity, sustenance, and currency. Before we take a look at the works of Matumbo, remember that I mentioned that Jane Alexander was her academic supervisor while in art school. Among a lot of artists at the time, the theme of human and animal, especially as it played out metaphorically in South Africa, was prevalent. Jane Alexander's Butcher Boys from 1986 was a work about human behavior and cultural abuse. It was a work that was meant to shock people into action to rid apartheid in South Africa 
by demonstrating the dehumanizing nature that white South Africans had placed on black South Africans at the time. These figures have been autopsied, have no mouths to speak, are blank and expressionless in the eye, and have horns like cattle of the field. It was the bestiality and dehumanizing effect of violence in apartheid South Africa that Alexander wanted to convey, and I feel her influence in Matumbo's works. With that said, let's take a look at this installation from 2012, Mbutfo. Mbutfo was the name of the traditional Swazi King's military regiment. This is a collection of 24 cowhides that hang regimentally from the ceiling. They are a mix of mannequin and material. They have no heads, no legs, and the arms seem to be suggested by the long animal hair that falls out of the torso. The gender could only be ascertained by the slight appearance of breasts. So what does this work convey? Well, to take a feminist approach, we could say that women have always been the other to men, and here we have the other. But they're not fully feminine. Remember, Mbutfo is a military group made up solely of men, but here they're absent. The woman is absent as well. What we see are impressions of the female form, but not the female form itself. Mtambo invites the viewer to step into someone else's skin and thus become a part of it. It was a way of evoking empathy in the struggles that came with being a woman, South African, and the oppression that came along with apartheid. We see the human-animal binary where we have animal skins suggesting the impression of human forms. We thus also see the conflict of gender roles where we should see men or these warrior guards, we see an absent female form lined up in rows as if on parade. Naomi Shore coined a term I think may be relevant here. Her term was saming. What she meant by this is the flip side of othering, which has always or has allowed women access to public recognition and to rights, but only to the degree that they are regarded as like men or the same as men. This work, in many ways, repels patriarchal ideas like this. Here the female has become the animal. It has become that which you oppress. But this by no means makes it weak, as its very title calls it a warrior or military guard. So it has power and forces you to see the strength of what you once considered weak or inferior. Power suppression. Male, female. Self, other. Human, animal. These are evocative concepts we see again and again in Matumbo's works. The next work I want to look at is from her Metamorphosis series, a work titled Minotaurus from 2012. Mtambo was a fan of mythology, and in particular Greek and Roman mythology. Here she has taken the work of Ovid in the story of the Minotaur and inserted herself, or at least an incantation of herself, into the form. The story of the Minotaur is thus. Poseidon sent a white bull to the king of Crete to be sacrificed. The king so fell in love with the beauty of the bull, he refused to sacrifice the animal. As punishment, Poseidon enchanted his wife, Queen Pasiphaea, to have sex with and ultimately give birth to this bull-human hybrid, the Minotaur. Here again, Mtumbo uses an aspect of the cow or bull, but this time in its imagery. This is a rather tall, imposing work you can see upstairs at the High Museum in Atlanta. The bronze cast is of herself as the Minotaur. You can think of this maybe as an incarnation of part of who Matumbo is. She says of the work, I take on another identity. I get in and out of this my skin, combining my traits with the ones of the character I am impersonating. It is an open-ended process, and a third figure emerges that is not me nor the original character, but rather an entity that borrows elements from both, and in so doing, acquires its own profile. As a viewer, you can again see the conflict within the work that you may have seen previously in Mbutfo. The Minotaur was originally male, here it is female. It was dangerous and wild and threatening, but here, its expression is soft and feminine and voluptuous. It really feels like a self-portrait in a way. It shows that these struggles of identity that we find within ourselves from time to time are shared by everyone. And while sometimes we may be aggressive and combative, 
we may also be caring and nurturing at the same time. Her embracing of and identifying with this human-animal hybrid leads us to two other works of hers from 2009, The Rape of Europa and Narcissus. These are photographic composites that are a retake again of classical mythology. The story of Europa is one of how Zeus abducted and eventually raped Europa and took her to Crete. As you may know, Zeus has an insatiable sexual appetite. Mtumbo's image was inspired by a drawing by Picasso on the subject. You can see the layouts are similar. Here we see Mtumbo as both Zeus and Europa. We see both Mtumbo's masculine features in Zeus and her feminine features in Europa. Ross Truscott says this of the work. It shows the predatory appetite of the rapist and the dehumanizing reduction of women to the level of a hunted animal. It's a dark and hidden sort of place where this encounter occurs. It shows again Mutombo's coupling of power and control to submission and weakness. There is also a sexual objectification of women and the fetishism of colonial rulers in the past as they had demeaned and animalized these black female bodies in the past. It also uses the human-animal hybrid again. It shows some androgyny in the roles played out in the tale of this encounter. The enclosed nature of the scene is shared somewhat by the enclosed nature of her installations with cowhide and the cowhide itself as it wraps around a human form. Narcissus, likewise, is equally dark and hidden. It, too, was inspired by a classic work of art by Caravaggio in his Narcissus take. Again, it is a similar layout, and Mutombo says herself that she's always been drawn to the darkness of Caravaggio's works, so it may be no surprise that she was inspired by this work. Again, we see her playing the role of a man in a classic mythological tale. The story goes that Narcissus was so captivated by his own beauty that upon seeing his reflection in a pond, he leaned in to kiss himself and ultimately drowned. This moment we see here is just before his death. Only this time, it would be her death. We find ourselves again in this dark recess away from prying eyes. The highlight is upon her face and her animalistic features. This is us seeing her again as that animalistic other. This work is about self-love and how we do and don't understand it sometimes. My personal feeling is that while she may be curious about the reflection she sees, I think she gains a lot of power from it, and that power moves forward in later works. I want to take this androgynous power one step further in this work by Mutombo, Prasa de Torres 1, 2, and 3 from 2008. Prasa de Torres was located in Portugal and was where black Mozambicans would fight for the entertainment of Portuguese colonizers. Even the act of making this work confronted her with sexual prejudices. She went to Spain and stayed with a family of bullfighters. The reti retired father refused to train her how to bullfight because she was female. She was surprised that it had nothing to do with her race or where she was from. It strictly fell along sexual lines. She would eventually work with a choreographer who would show her the dance-like moves of a bullfighter. This story of the process speaks to what the work is about. This is a photographic display of Mutombo's own acceptance of her androgyny. We see her in this arena that was a masculine place, which echoes the sculpting world which was also predominantly masculine. She is wearing a cowhide vest which makes that connection with the animal other, and she wears it as a beautiful adornment, similar to the beautiful outfits that male bullfighters would wear in the ring. Let's not forget the violence against animals that would take place in this ring. She, the animal-human hybrid, battling the invisible animal, associating herself with the physical harm of animals and human alike in this very arena. So there is a strong connection again with human-animal, power control, male-female. We see all this in this series. Nadifa Matumbo thought of the art of bullfighting was like a dance. It reminded her of the Paso Doble in Spain. Which brings us to this video work by Montambo titled Paso Doble 2011. I'll put a link to the video work in the description below, but these are the image stills from the video you're seeing now. 
What you see are the quick, elegant movements of these two forms as they move together against a non paso doble type music. The beat and the dance moves are somewhat off as they work together to find some cohesion. This is purposeful. This dance is normally perform performed by a male and female dancer, but here you have two female dancers. You only spot them occasionally as most of the video is shot with the heads cut off. So we have androgynous forms attempting to move together against a difficult musical backdrop. This again is a reflection of her own struggles with her identity, and it pulls from the Prase de Torres work in this beautiful conflict. Nandifa Matumbo's art is a confrontation. It is a memory. It is a protection. It is a symbol of the other and the encounters the other may feel. It is a hybridization of multiple themes. Mutombo embraces the ambiguity of her persona and utilizes the traumatically organic nature of cowhides as they relate to black Africans and their experiences with racism and apartheid. There is a constant clash within her works, both socially and personally, that I hope you may see now. These binaries are real and bridge a gap for us as viewers as we continue our interactions with society and self.